All right. <clears throat> so welcome, everybody. Um, so this is the Staying Cool in the Garden and Orchard class. Um, and I am Dean Gunderson, the Director of Education here at Seed St. Louis. So <clears throat> first, um, when I'm talking about, you know, staying cool in the garden, I'm sure you already know this because you registered for the class. But um, what we're going to be talking about is, is basically how to deal with, with heat. Um, so first, we're going to talk about why heat matters or like why it's a problem. I mean, most of us know why it's inconvenient for ourselves, but, um, but for the garden, your orchard, all those different things. Um, and the main reason is that high heat causes stress. Um, it, you know, humans and plants can't really function well at high temperatures. There's kind of a, a threshold of temperatures at which kind of most biological processes just kind of stall out. Um, and so adaptations to heat for the most part generally involve just surviving until the temperatures come back down below a point at which um, things can start can start functioning well again. Uh, so this usually means just shutting down biological processes or slowing down biological processes. Um, and this is why you will notice during really long um, stretches of heat, you know, if it's just one day, you're not going to notice it. But if it's, you know, two, three weeks in a row, like we've been having, um, you're going to notice that your plants really aren't growing. Um, because they, they've really kind of shut down a lot of what they're doing. Um, and it's why in the heat, you don't really want to do anything. It's why usually you're not very hungry when it's really hot. It's because your body's just like, it's too hot. I don't want to be digesting stuff. Digesting stuff makes heat. I can't handle any more heat. Um, and so that's like kind of one of the main ways that, that, that organisms deal with heat is just kind of slowing everything down and, and trying to, to ride out this, the storm in a, in a sense. Um, so some plants, though, are able to handle higher temperatures than others, um, but even those, if the temperature gets high enough, they're going to start suffering the same stress, the same problems as, as other plants. It's just kind of a, a spectrum of how, um, how much heat they can tolerate, but at some point, heat is always going to stress any plant. Um, uh, and then, and kind of the same with people. So, you know, different people kind of deal with heat um, uh, in different in different ways. You know, some people um, heat really bothers them. Some people, you know, heat doesn't bother them as much. Um, and so, there is like some adaptation that can kind of go on there, and you can get used to it. So, you know, you'll uh, if you work outside regularly, or you know someone who works outside, you know, the heat doesn't bother them quite as much as if you you know work in an office and you're in air conditioning all the time. Um, and that's just like you know our bodies kind of um, adapting to those things. But, but it is still causing stress. And if the temperature gets high enough, it is still going to, to create those, those issues. So, so what are those issues? You know, when, when things have stress, what, is that, um, what does that cause or kind of what negative things might you, might you see? So in plants, um, and this is, you know, orchard and, um, and vegetable uh, as, and ornamental, I'm real, all plants, um, you're gonna notice that the, the growth is going to slow. They're gonna grow um, at a slower rate, they're not going to grow as much. They might stop growing kind of all together for a certain amount of time. Uh, you're going to see kind of reduced yields during those those heat spells, and and you know for up to a couple weeks after the heat breaks, um, which uh, which can be caused by a couple different things. One can be caused by the flowers literally aborting, like the plants will just abort flowers um, or even like small immature fruit. Uh, if the if the heat is intense enough, the plant kind of does the math and is like, I don't have the energy to to mature this fruit, and so I gotta I gotta cut it loose, or it's or it's gonna kill me. Um, and so like um, peppers are kind of famous for that. If temperatures get up into the 90s, you're not gonna get any peppers, at, at least sweet peppers. It's, it's just not gonna happen um, because they just they just abort their flowers. They just drop them. Um, in the squash family, uh, you will probably notice, and or you might have noticed already that you might have lots of flowers, but you're not getting any fruit. Um, so squash plants, when the temperatures are really high, they will continue to produce male flowers, but they will not produce female flowers, which means you're not gonna get any fruit because the female flowers are where the fruit actually develop. Um, you're gonna see reduced pollinator activity. Insects also don't like the extreme heat. Um, and so when the temperatures get really high, even if you do have lots of flowers and you're like, there's female flowers on my squash and I'm still not getting it. Well, it might be because the pollinators are also trying to escape the heat and they're just not, not, um, not around enough to, 
to pollinate those flowers when they're needed. It can also cause plants to bolt or turn bitter. So this is especially if you have cool season crops that are still in the ground. So like, you know, if you still have lettuce going into this current heat wave we had, I would be shocked if you still have lettuce today. Um, it probably bolted, got bitter, was, is nasty, not very good anymore. Um, it can also cause stunting in plants, which is, you know, just kind of like, you know, the growth is slow. They're gonna, they're gonna kind of stay small. Um, and in extreme cases, it'll kill plants. You know, if, if the temperature is high enough or the plant is sensitive enough, the plant, you know, might, might just die. Uh, and in people, it can be um, frustrating in kind of the best situations. You know, just being in the heat is kind of annoying. It's not comfortable. Um, but it can also be dangerous, leading to heat exhaustion or even heat stroke, which can be life-threatening. Um, and children, seniors, and those with chronic illnesses are most at risk. For, for overheating and for things like heat exhaustion and heat stroke. Um, so, you know, even if you're outside and you feel comfortable, probably doesn't mean you should, you know, have a two-year-old out there with you. Um, like their, their, their bodies are, are more sensitive to that. Um, so you do need to be, to be careful with heat. It's, it's pretty serious. Um, another reason why heat matters is that, you know, if you're in St. Louis, uh, we have a lot of it. Uh, we have on average 35 to 40 days a year um, over 90 degrees um, since 1870, like since records, um, temperature records have, have started, um, an average of, you know, 35 to 40 days. So, you know, over a month of days over 90 degrees on average, um, and an average of, you know, somewhere between one and, you know, five days over 100 on average since 1870. Uh, those numbers are getting significantly worse. Um, in the last 50 years, St. Louis, or in the next 50 years, St. Louis is predicted to have 55 to 97 days um, a year over 90 degrees, um, depending on uh, what emission scenario we uh, end up at. Um, but that, that 35 to 40, I think like the last five years, we've averaged about 50. So, I mean, we're already, you know, that swing is already coming. Um, we're getting more and more of those hot days. And so we need to be paying attention. And also heat is complex, um, especially where we're at. Uh, you know, any good St. Louisan will tell you uh, that it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Um, we do get pretty hot, but it is our um, pretty significant heat, um, pretty significant humidity that really makes the heat um, unbearable and, and more dangerous than you might um, expect from just the, like the temperature number that you'll see. Um, so how hot it actually feels and thus how much stress is actually being put on your body um, is really made up of three main factors. So there's the temperature. So like, you know, when you get the temperature and it said the high was, you know, 92 today or, you know, whatever. Um, I always like to point out that that temperature reading is taken in the shade, which most people do not know. They think, oh, of course you take the temperature in the sun. It's not, it's taken in the shade. So that is the temperature that it feels like in the shade. Um, but humidity is also pretty significant. Evaporation of water off your skin cools you, um, and that's why you sweat. That's why we sweat, is to, is to do that. But the higher the humidity, the slower that evaporation happens, and thus the less effective um, sweating cools your body off. So the higher the humidity, the more hot you're going to feel, even if the air temperature is exactly the same. And then sun exposure. Um, again, as anyone can tell you, you know, standing in the sun feels much hotter than being in the shade. So even if the air temperature is exactly the same, you know, you, you take that air temperature that says 92 degrees in the shade, in the sun, it's still 92 degrees, but the sun hitting you caught, like literally causes your skin to heat up. So it's not the air temperature that's hotter, but you get hotter and you can be 10 to 15 degrees hotter than that um, temperature that they tell you, you know, so if it's 92 degrees and you're standing in the sun, it actually feels like, you know, 102 to 106 degrees, um, which is you know, a big difference. <clears throat> so heat stress in plants, the higher the temperature, the faster water is lost from, um, it's supposed to say stomata, um, so is lost from the plants as it performs photosynthesis. So plants you know, perform photosynthesis. Part of that is, is the loss of, of water to the atmosphere. The hotter it is, the faster they're gonna lose water to the atmosphere. Um, as temperatures increase, it's, they're losing more and more and more water. And there becomes a point at which the plant kind of does the math somehow and figures out that the energy that it's producing from photosynthesis is not worth the amount of water that is being lost. And it just starts shutting down. It just starts closing 
those, those stomata, which is where the, the water comes out, but also where the CO2 comes in, which is needed for photosynthesis. Um, and so as that happens, as the temperatures continue to get higher and higher and higher, they will, they will shut down, you know, and it'll go from 100% to like 80% and then 60%. And eventually the temperature gets hot enough that the plants just are not photosynthesizing at all. Uh, the temperature at which this point is reached depends on what type of photosynthesis is being used um, and the individual plant. So different plants have different um, tolerances to heat, but there's also, this is just interesting information, three main types of photosynthesis, um, which I'm just gonna mention because they're really cool. Um, so the first is C3. So if you, you know, know photosynthesis from school, you know, like CO2 comes in and it uses sunlight and CO2 and water to like make carbohydrates and sugar. Like that's how plants grow is they make their own food out of literally thin air. Um, so, so that just kind of like basic explanation is what C3 photosynthesis is. So this is what the vast majority of plants on the planet are using. Uh, these are also the types of plants that are most sensitive to high temperatures. So the optimum temperature for photosynthesis of this, of like C3 photosynthesis is 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, when temperatures reach 86 degrees, photosynthesis starts shutting down. And when you get into like, you know, 90s, you know, low 90s, they're really not photosynthesizing at all. Um, so this is virtually all garden crops and every single orchard plant. Um, uses C3 photosynthesis. So, you know, we're talking about days where the high is in the mid 90s. Um, you know, by the time that you're reaching, you know, 86 degrees in late afternoon, photosynthesis is starting to ramp down. And by, you know, in those middle of the afternoon times when you're like, oh, there's lots of sun, they must be producing lots of energy. They're producing zero energy um, if the, if, at those temperatures. So C3 photosynthesis is a type that is a little bit more efficient where they're able to um, open kind of fewer stomata because they're able to concentrate the CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so because of this, they, the, the kind of temperature um, can, the, the temperature they can tolerate is higher because they're not losing as much water for the amount of energy they can produce. So the optimum temperature for C4 photosynthesis is like 86 to 100 degrees and above 100 degrees, it's shutting down. Um, in terms of things that we grow, you know, in the garden and orchard, the only things that really use C4 is like corn, amaranth, sorghum, and millet. So really corn and amaranth. Um, there's also a third type of photosynthesis that's just fascinating called CAM, where plants like through magic, basically, I don't, I don't, I mean, some crazy chemistry, um, wizardry, uh, they're able to like store sunlight during the day as like chemical energy and then open the stomata and get the CO2 at night. So they're not losing like any water at all. It's crazy. So succulents mostly use this. It's how they're adapted to, to really dry hot conditions. Um, and their optimum temperatures are like over 95 degrees. Um, the only things really that we eat that fit into cam are like purslane or prickly pear cactus or pineapples. Mm -hmm. Um, which we're not really growing those things here. So then how do you actually you know, de deal with the heat? So you know, heat's a problem. How do you actually deal with it? Um, so first we're gonna talk about how to help plants survive heat and to tolerate heat. Um, so kind of what we're gonna talk about is one of the, the big things you can do is select plants that have a higher adaptation to heat in the first place. So you know, if you live in St. Louis or you live somewhere else that's really hot, um, you know that you know, the heat's gonna be coming. You know, even if you're like, oh, I hope it's gonna be you know, a mild summer, it might be but it's probably gonna be hot, at least at some point. So picking things that are uh, more tolerant of that heat is gonna mean that you're not gonna, that you are not gonna be as stressed trying to baby these plants along through heat um, when there's big, um, big spikes in temperature like we've been having. So we're gonna talk about crops that are more tolerant. So just certain crops are more tolerant of heat than others. And then we'll also talk about some specific like varieties or cultivars that are more heat tolerant um, kind of within, within a crop. Uh, it's also very important to provide plenty of water in order to compensate for the additional water loss that um, the plants are experiencing. And it can also help keep the, the soil um, a little cooler, which helps keep the, the roots a little cooler, which reduces stress on the plants. You also want to conserve water, again, to make sure that they have as much water as possible, that you're not just losing all the water to evaporation um, or just running off um, the soil as you're watering it. And providing shade is a, is a really big thing that can be done. And you can either do this um, kind of naturally or through some artificial means. Um, and you wanna really be providing shade to both the plant 
and to the soil. Both of those things can have benefits. So first, heat tolerant plants. Uh, so some plants are just more heat tolerant than others. Um, generally, these are plants that use C4 or CAM photosynthesis. So like we talked about, you know, things that have those different types of photosynthesis um, just inherently are able to handle higher temperatures um, and or they are from hot, dry climates. So plants that adapted in, in naturally um, hot and dry conditions even if they're using you know, the C3 photosynthesis, are able to take heat better. They have better adaptations than a plant that was you know, originally from Denmark or Scotland or Russia. Um, it's you know, just what they do. Uh, so some examples of that in the orchard are things like jujubes, which, were, which are originally from kind of Northwestern China, which is very hot and dry. Um, pecans, which are from mostly the Mississippi River Valley, although we think of them as a southern crop, they're also native around here, um, but it's also really hot here. Uh, figs, which are a Mediterranean crop, and almonds and pomegranates, which are all Mediterranean crops, all of which can be grown here, believe it or not. Um, and if you want to know how, come to our orchard classes. Um, okra, which is another, um, which in the garden is an unbelievably awesome crop, um, especially for hot, dry conditions. It's originally from Sub Saharan Africa, incredibly resilient. Um, crop to grow. Sweet potatoes, originally from the Amazon, very heat tolerant. Um, corn, which has C4 photosynthesis and is originally from Mexico, pretty heat tolerant. Sunflowers, which are originally from uh, the Great Plains, very heat tolerant. Um, sorghum, Sub-Saharan Africa. Malabar spinach, um, originally from the Indian subcontinent, very heat and humidity tolerant, um, which is very nice. Um, so Malabar spinach, uh, you might not be familiar with, uh, so that's what this picture is here. It's a vining crop. Um, the leaves have are like a very kind of succulent, um, juicy leaf um, that you usually you cook and you eat kind of like as a spinach replacement, but it grows throughout the summer. So you'd be planting it kind of when your, your spring spinach is, is bolting and going bad. Uh, you can plant your Malabar spinach, eat that all summer. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Some people, some people don't like it, but I quite enjoy it. Um, purslane is another one uh, that's originally from the Mediterranean, but is a very common weed around here now, but it's edible, very good. Um, it's a succulent. It uses CAM photosynthesis, incredibly heat um, and drought tolerant, and the humidity also does not bother it at all. Uh, Celosia, which is actually um, a type of, um, oh, what's the common name? Coxcomb, I think is what it's called, um, which is like an annual flower that's usually grown here. Uh, but that plant was originally domesticated as a as a green, as a, a you know a cooked green um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and so it's adapted to those kind of hot, um, dry conditions. There um, does beautifully here, and pollinators go crazy for it when it flowers. Amaranth uh, is is a C4 photosynthesizer, unbelievably heat and drought tolerant. And when I say that, I'm, I'm talking like we had some that somebody dropped seeds in our hoop house that we don't run in the summer where it's like gravel on the ground, like it's like packed clay and then gravel and it was growing in there without any water and it was 140 degrees most days um, because we weren't running fans or anything and it just grew, produced seed, did its own thing. Um, Amaranth is incredibly heat, heat tolerant and also it's unbelievably humid um, around here, grows great. That's another one that you can um, eat the greens of. The greens are really, really nutritious. Uh, you can also grow it for the seeds, which are similar to quinoa. Uh, pigeon pea is another one that we just had success last year. We were able to find a variety that grows here. Uh, most pigeon peas will not produce here. Uh, they're originally from the Indian subcontinent and they don't, uh, their flowering doesn't normally work well here. They flower too late in the fall and then free, frost kills them before you get anything. Um, but we did find one cultivar that does well that we're now selling um, on our um, on our website if you're interested in trying some. Uh, it's really pretty, if nothing else, but it produces these little um, pods that you pop open and there's a little, um, it's kind of like a shelling pea. Um, it's kind of it's kind of how you would use it um, that you eat, but they produce from like mid-July through frost, really. Um, they produce for a long, long time. 
Uh, cow peas and yard long beans, which are also, you know, kind of green beans or shelling um, beans uh, that are unbelievably heat and drought tolerant, both originally from um, Sub-Saharan Africa. And then Chinese lettuce um, or seltus or stem lettuce, it's got a bunch of different names, um, is actually the same species as the lettuce that is commonly grown for, for, for salad, like for leaf vegetables. Um, but what it was instead bred for was for a delicious stem after it bolts. So you grow the lettuce, it grows, it's got kind of these big, long kind of romaine type leaves, which you can harvest when it's little, but then when it gets hot and it bolts, um, you know, the bolting happens, but then instead of just being like, oh, I got to throw this away, it's bad. You just rip all the leaves off. So this is here on the left, like you, you, um, you know, you rip it up and it looks like this. You strip all the leaves off and you get this um, big thick stem and you peel off the skin on the outside. And it's this really good succulent, um, mildly sweet uh, vegetable that that looks almost like the inside of a kiwi like it's like semi-translucent it's a little kind of like squishy kind of like a kiwi um, I really like it it's it's pretty good and you can grow it in both the spring and the summer <clears throat> but uh, there's also some varieties and cultivars that are more heat tolerant so you know just because it's not on this list doesn't mean you can't necessarily find a good one to grow um, because heat tolerance can vary widely between varieties of the same, of the same crop. Uh, a good kind of rule of thumb, if you're looking, you know, if you want to grow lettuce or, or if you want to grow tomatoes and you're like, I want a heat tolerant lettuce or a heat, sorry, if you want to grow tomatoes and you're like, I want one that is going to be well adapted to heat. Well, then don't pick a tomato that was bred in Russia. Um, they do sell those and, and they're really good if you want an early season tomato, but then when it gets hot, they don't really like it. Um, you know, pick one that was bred in Texas or Florida or Mexico. Um, you know, pick things that are from hot locations if you want them to be heat tolerant. Because if they were bred in that area, it means they had to have been bred to survive in that area. And if that area is hot, it's going to be able to survive in heat. So maybe need to do a little bit of geography investigation um, and find varieties from from those areas that are that are kind of on the hot side. <clears throat> so some uh, that I would just like um, to mention here are things like Seminole pumpkins. Um, so these are a great baking pumpkin that was originally bred by the Seminole, um, the Seminole Nation uh, when they were down in what's now um, Southern Florida or, or the Everglades. So very hot, very humid. Um, they actually don't like it here until it gets miserable outside. Um, but when the temperatures are really hot um, and humid, they just like, they'll grow like a foot a day, just crazy fast. Um, and just take over a whole area. Uh, Trombencino squash is another one that's uh, a, an heirloom variety from Italy um, that just, again, grows really well when it gets hot and humid. Um, compared to other squash, you don't get like the wilting that squash will get sometimes when they get um, overly hot. Uh, most lettuce, like I said, if you like stem lettuce is really what I think is the best option for heat. But if you're just looking for like leaf lettuce type things and you want something that is heat tolerant, um, two of the best that we found are, are the, the seedlings that we sell, um, which is green towers lettuce if you want a romaine, and then salanova lettuces. Um, there's lots of different salanova lettuces, um, but the salanova lettuce um, all seem to do pretty well. Um, for cauliflower, we really like Minuteman cauliflower. Cauliflower does really well. And then there's these three different bok choy um, that we found do really well. And this is um, just a good picture to kind of show you how much uh, variety you can get in terms of like within the same kind of species, the same crop. So this was a, a trial bed that we did. Of, I believe it was eight different bok choy to try and find one that was heat tolerant. These were all ones that said they were heat tolerant. This picture was taken in mid-May, at which point it had got, this was um, last year or two years ago, I can't remember, at which point it had gotten warm, but it was not excessively hot. Um, and you can see here, this variety is already fully bolted in like mid-May. Uh, these three down here, which is um, uh, Joy Choi is this one on the right, and then Chun Yu and Chun Mai are on the far left here. Uh, those didn't bolt uh, until late June, early July. So, you know, quite a difference um, within the same crop. So just because you have something and you're like, oh, it didn't really like the heat, try a different variety as well. You know I mean, you just, you never know what you'll find. And that was the same with cauliflower. We grew, we have grown so many different cauliflower 
most of them just, they all are garbage here. They just can't take the heat. They can't take um, our sudden, sudden onset summers. Um, but Minuteman, it's fine. It, it takes the heat for a cauliflower really well. <clears throat> so other than picking um, plants that are well adapted, um, you also, like I said, need to provide plenty of water. Uh, you wanna make sure that the plants have enough water. Um, but like always, you don't want to like, you don't want to waterlog them. You don't want there to be standing water all the time, um, but you don't want them to be drying out. Um, photosynthesis will shut down and plants will be stressed at lower temperatures, the more deficient in water they are. So, you know, that number I gave of like photosynthesis starts shutting down at 86 degrees. Well, if there's really no water in the soil, photosynthesis is going to shut down at a much lower temperature than that. So you really need to make sure that they have, um, plenty of water so that, um, you know, if you have a day that it's going to get up into the 90s, um, first thing in the morning, it's not in the 90s. So in that morning, those first couple hours of the morning where it might be really pretty cool, if there's water in the soil, the plants will be photosynthesizing at that time, um, which is a really important time for them to be able to do that so that they can kind of fix damage that happened yesterday during the extreme heat when they weren't photosynthesizing and kind of like kind of get their stuff together and get ready for the, the upcoming heat. But if they don't have enough water, they can't do that. So you really wanna make sure that uh, you're watering your plants as often as is necessary. And the best way to find that out is to, is to check the soil. Uh, so if you, if you check with your finger is what I always say, if you stick your finger in up to this kind of middle joint here, if you stick it in and the water and the soil feels moist, then you don't need to water. There's enough water there. If you stick your finger in and it's dry, you need to water. Uh, and that's really the best way to find out, you know, the like water every day or water every other day. I don't find those to be overly helpful for like an in-ground garden situation because how often you need to water it and depends entirely on how big is the plant. Um, how hot is it? You know, I mean, there's just so many different variables um, on that, that those kind of prescriptions, I just don't find very helpful. Um, if you're growing in a container, though, you need to be watering every day. Um, they dry out really fast. You need to be watering every day if, when it's hot like this. Um, and then what time to water? People ask about this a lot. Um, I always say whenever you can. I mean, watering is more important than when you water. You know, if you're like, oh, I missed the perfect morning window. I guess I'll do it tomorrow. Don't do it tomorrow. Go out and do it now. Um, so whenever you can is the best time to do it. But if you can, you know, pick, ideally the morning is my favorite time to water because it's in that cool part of the morning where the plants can be photosynthesizing the most. So the water is going to be used um, well. It's also um, not going to be a situation where the plant is really hot and then you're splashing what is normally pretty cold water coming out of the, the hose on them, um, which can be a little shocking to the plant. Um, and it also means that there's, you know, you're going into really sunny time, which is going to dry off all the foliage. So you're going to have less issues with um, fungal diseases um, versus if, you know, if you water like right before the sun goes down and then the leaves stay wet, um, you know, for, you know, all, all, all night, potentially, if the humidity is high, then that's a great time for fungus to start infecting your plant. Um, versus if you do it in the morning, the leaves are going to dry off really quickly. You're probably going to avoid a lot of those fungal diseases that um, having wet foliage can, can cause. And then mulch. Mulch is really, really important um, if you're looking to, to reduce stress on plants um, in terms of heat. Uh, you'll meet people out there that are like very opposed to mulch, especially like in the vegetable garden, because it can potentially harbor pests and things like that. And that's true, but it can also harbor spiders and beneficial insects that'll eat those pests. Um, and when you're talking about heat, I think the mulch is well worth it. Um, so mulch benefits your plants in two, in at least two different ways. So mulch conserves moisture, so, you know, if you water your plants in the morning and there's, and it's just bare soil, the soil can actually dry out pretty quickly um, because you're losing moisture directly from evaporation um, versus the, the, the mulch will act as kind of like a, like a, an insulator. So like it can dry out the mulch, but it's harder to pull the moisture out of the soil through the mulch for, um, for the sun to do that. And mulch also helps keep the soil cooler. Um, so there was a, there was studies that was done, um, in like big agricultural operations for like corn and soy fields. And they found that the soil temperature in no-till corn and bean fields, which still have like the, 
the plant crop residue on the top, so like mulch, um, were the soil temperature was eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than fields that had been tilled, which have no mulch on top at all. Um, so I mean, eight to 10 degrees is, is pretty significant, particularly in, in soil temperatures. You know, air, air temperatures can fluctuate um, pretty drastically. For soil temperature differences of that high can be pretty significant um, for crops. And those higher temperatures in the soil, again, are gonna accelerate evaporation. Um, which means that, again, you're going to be losing more moisture. You're going to need to water more frequently. Um, there's going to be more stress on your plants in that way. Um, in terms of what mulch to use, any plant material can be a mulch. Anything that used to be a plant can be a mulch. Uh, my favorites are straw um, for, for the vegetable garden. My favorites are straw and leaves. So like leaves that fell off your tree last year um, are, and straw are my two favorites. This is straw around some, some onions. Where it's, a, it's a great mulch. But you can also use weeds that you pulled out of your of your garden, you know, rip out the weed and just throw it back down on the soil. Um, or like grass clippings. Um, if you're going to do grass clippings, I would like, I, I don't usually like mowing and bagging them is usually not a great idea. But if you've got like some long grass and you cut it and so it like dries and then you rake that up and put it on, um, that usually works better. Um, if you're like cutting into a, a bag, oftentimes they they end up being wet and kind of matting together, and that can cause some some issues, which are not which are not great. Um, for around your orchard plants, I always always heat or not always recommend mulch, um, and the mulch that I recommend is is wood chips. Um, you can also use straw or leaves or other things if you have them, uh, but wood chips are really great. They last a really long time. Um, they're they're really the best for for any of your trees, shrubs, things like that. Um, I generally do not recommend wood chips for the vegetable garden. Um, the plants like them just fine, um, but because wood chips last so long, they they can be difficult to deal with in terms of like, um, you know, if you mulch down and then you want to plant stuff in the fall, it can be difficult to kind of clear the soil of it in order to get things planted. Um, so you, you you can use wood chips. I just wouldn't recommend it if you have another option. And then providing shade. Providing shade is a, is a really powerful tool that you can use um, to deal with heat um, that's, that's done on, on large commercial scales as well for, for produce production. Um, so in summer when the sun is very intense, uh, you know, like, like now, you know, we're just a couple of days ago was the solstice. So the sun was, you know, we have the longest days. The sun is the most intense. It's, you know, as close to overhead as you can get. The amount of energy you're getting like per square foot is like a thousand watts of energy per like hour or something crazy. Um, so, you know, a huge amount of light energy and it's actually more than plants need. Um, there's a point at which the amount of light um, hitting a plant is kind of as much as it can use for photosynthesis and anything above that is, is just excess. It doesn't do anything beneficial to the plant. And so in, in these, you know, couple months in the middle of summer where it's really hot, there's usually also more than enough light. And so you can actually provide some shade on plants, even things like tomatoes and peppers and things that want full sun, where, you know, they're still getting direct sun, but it's just, you know, kind of damped a little bit. You just get a little bit of shade um, and that can actually help them stay cooler um, without cutting the amount of, of usable light that they can get. Like they're still getting all the light they can possibly need. So, um, so in those instances, it can actually boost growth because you can keep the soil and the air temperature under that structure kind of below those thresholds at which they start shutting down photosynthesis for a couple more hours in the morning than if there was no shade. And it can, you know, cool down or like, you know, lower below that temperature, you know, maybe an hour or so earlier in the afternoon. So it, it just kind of shortens that window where the temperature is too hot um, around the plant for photosynthesis to continue and it just reduces that um, that stress um so for for things like so warm season crops so you know most of the stuff that you've probably got in your garden at this point so you know all the stuff that you hopefully waited until like may to plant april may to plant <clears throat> you usually can do up to like a 30 percent shade um, anything more than that you're going to start cutting yields because they they um because you're going to be cutting out too much light. However, for cool season things that you might still have in your garden, so things like 
chard or kale or collards or maybe that cabbage that hasn't quite filled its head yet or um, or maybe you, you do still have some lettuce hanging on. Um, shade from 40 all the way up to 60% um, is, is actually a better amount for them to keep them cooler um, because they can't quite use as much um, as much light uh, because they're because they're adapted to further northern latitudes originally. Uh, so this is just a picture of, of a farm that I took an urban farm that I toured a couple of years ago where they had done like a hoop house like usually we would think like oh cover plastic to keep it warm but they had covered it with shade cloth so it's you know an anti greenhouse so instead of you know keeping warm in the summer it's to keep cool or keeping warm in the winter it's to keep cool in the summer. Uh, so you can do that that same thing over a whole garden big tall structure if you want uh, that's probably more expensive than most people want to do and so we'll talk about uh, some other options. So in terms of providing shade, there's really kind of three main um, kind of artificial options. So like materials that you would be using as shade uh, that I would recommend. So one is row cover, which is not ideal, but you might already have row cover, which is why I bring it up. So row cover is generally used to, to keep things warm. It's also called frost blanket. Um, it is also used sometimes as a barrier to keep insect pests out. Um, however, it does retain heat, which is why it's useful in the winter to, to extend the season. And so if you are going to use it as, as a shade, because it does, it does provide some shade, you would not want to do what this picture is showing. So this is what you would do in the winter. Uh, if you were wanting to do, uh, to use this type of fabric, which is row cover, um, for shade purposes to keep cool, you would want to have it like suspended above the plants so that there's still plenty of airflow. It's not going to be accumulating heat. Um, so this is a picture of what you do not want to do for row cover. And I've got a picture on the next slide of what you do want to do. Um, but this is a material that you could potentially use. Not ideal, but if you already have it, you know, worth a try. If you're able to, to get a material specifically to keep things cool, which I would recommend, um, kind of the, the like standard, like the thing that's used on big commercial operations and that people always talk about and that all the studies and everything are about, um, is a material called shade cloth. So it's a, it's a like loose knit um, fabric type material that is made specifically to shade crops. Like that's, it's, that was what it's invented for. Um, so one, so in terms of what shade cloth can help with, that's also like what the studies are on is this specific material. Um, and that's what this picture is, is this is shade cloth here, this kind of black, and you can see where you can see through it, but it's not, you know, a clear picture. So it's cutting some of the light, but not all of it. And you can see the shade that it's casting under, um, under the net. So one person um, that did a test got a 30 degree Fahrenheit reduction in temperature um, underneath it. However, most companies and most people that you'll talk to say that you can expect like a 10 to 15 degree reduction um, on average from that material. Uh, which again can be pretty significant if you're talking like, oh, it's going to be 100 degrees. Well, if it's down to 90 degrees, photosynthesis can still happen at 90 degrees. At 100 degrees, even C4 starts shutting down. Um, or, you know, 15 degrees, I mean, it's going down to like 85. Everything can photosynthesize at like full, full speed ahead um, at 85 degrees. And so, you know, that 10 to 15 degrees reduction can be pretty significant um, depending on your situation. It's also kind of interesting. Most shade cloth that you will see is black. I don't know why. I don't know if it's just easier to make this material black or if that's just its natural color, um, but you can buy it in different colors. And there's been studies that have shown that lighter colors um, allow more light through while still reducing temperature, um, which is interesting. So um, black reduces PAR, which is a measure of like the light that plants can use for photosynthesis. So black shade cloth reduces that usable light by 47 to 54%, while a white shade cloth, like that is blocking like the same amount of sky area, only reduces uh, that usable light by 29 to 41%. So it can, um, so it can allow more light through while still reducing the temperature the same amount as a black shade cloth. Um, because the white is able to reflect off more of the of the heat. Um, and so uh, if you're buying shade cloth and you can find a lighter colored one, I'd probably recommend 
doing a white shade cloth or a light gray or something like that um, and not do a black. Although again, usually black is the easiest one to find. Uh, another material that we actually just got in, I think yesterday that we'll be selling um, is you can also use uh, this, these kind of natural fabric materials, um, which I, which I, I like, I like better than shade cloth simply because they're like natural fibers that will like, you know, you can compost when you're done with them as opposed to shade cloth, which is plastic. Um, but these are, are basically, they look like a really loose weave burlap fabric. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a fabric that's used as erosion control. So these are the big mats that they'll roll out over like, you know, a slope where they'll like seed it and then they'll roll this over to kind of hold, to hold stuff in place. And this is the picture of it here. So you can see it looks like a burlap, but it's the holes are much bigger. And so this is going to be about that 30% um, shade. So this would be, you know, you'd put like one layer of this over, um, you know, tomatoes, peppers, corn, you know, like warm season crops like that. Uh, and if you had cool season stuff too, you could use that, that same material, but just do two layers or fold it in half. And then you're going to get about a 60% reduction, um, which is what those, those cool season crops can handle if you have them still growing. Uh, in the summer, and this and the and these shade cloth materials can also be really helpful when you're trying to get your your fall garden started, which again are cool season crops, but you're usually trying to plant them uh, sometime in August, at which point it's still usually really hot, and so having you know two layers of this, which is going to block out sixty percent, is going to help keep them cooler uh, while they're growing for that first month or so, uh, when the temperatures are still pretty high, if you're wanting to do a fall garden. So how to use these fabrics? Um, you can just lay it over the plants, um, but this does reduce airflow, so it's not ideal. Um, but you can just kind of lay it over plants if you need to. Uh, you can put it also put it over your existing hoops um, that you might have used in the fall, spring, or winter um, for plastic or row cover for, for season extension. So if you had kind of those wire hoops, um, like this picture down here, um, there's kind of these wire hoops that, you know, in the winter, these people used for um, for row cover to keep the plants warm. Uh, and now in the summer, they use those same hoops to put shade cloths to keep these beets that are underneath there cool so that they can um, weather the heat and hopefully get, get a nice full crop. Um, if it goes all the way to the ground, you can just use sod staples or bricks or whatever to kind of hold it down. If it doesn't go all the way down, so like the, the fabric that we sell um, is only four feet wide, um, and that's so it's you can still like reach under without having to roll stuff up um, and the shade and, and it, it just allows more airflow um, in there. For those, um, I recommend having like binder clips. Um, so, you know, if the fabric only comes to, you know, say here, then you just have a binder clip and clip it um, onto that that wire hoop and it'll kind of hold it just on the top part to shade the plants. Uh, you can also use poles at the corner of the bed or the berm or whatever um, to hold it up like a canopy, kind of like this this here. You know, just kind of stick some some poles in the ground, run some stuff across, and just kind of drape it over um, as a shade structure in that regard. Uh, there's also some kind of like um, like plant like you can have some plants shade other plants. Um, so if you're trying to grow cool season crops into the heat you can intercrop to provide shade. So, uh, you know, plant things like, just as an example, you could plant things like lettuce, heading brassica, or bok choy that, um, that you might, that you might want to, you know, be growing into May, June, you know, hopefully July, although you I mean, really, you know, realistically June, um, kind of on the north side of your bed. And then you can plant tall summer crops like tomatoes, corn, okra, or amaranth um, on the south side of the bed. So then if you've got your, your kind of cool season things on the north, and then you've got tall, um, warm season stuff on the south, the sun comes from the south, it's going to block and shade um, those plants a little bit for you um, to keep them cooler. You could also do something like we did at our demo garden, um, where we built this kind of weird looking trellis, where we grew squash up here, and then it produced this nice shade under here where we were able, like this, this picture is in, um, I think, September. So you can see in here, these are beet plants. So we planted beets um, when it was still hot so that they could get going. Um, and the shade uh, kept them cool. And then we got a nice beet harvest in the fall. <clears throat> so then keeping yourself cool. Um, so this is also really critical. Um, and I found some interesting things or things that I thought was interesting while I was um, uh, 
finalizing this presentation. Uh, so this is, you know, critical. Heat is nothing to mess around with, and it can be incredibly dangerous. Um, you know, if the temperatures are really hot, it can be, I mean, even potentially life-threatening um, if it's bad enough. And kind of the things that we'll talk about is just like working smart, staying hydrated, um, dressing smart, uh, produce shade for yourself, um, produce airflow, and then there are some some actually really cool active cooling options, like things that are almost like little, they're not air conditioners, but like ways to actively cool yourself, like things that are that are cold that can cool your, your body down, even if you're outside. So work smart. Uh, you need to know when it's hot, which sounds like a, yeah, I know when it's hot outside. Um, but uh, like we talked about earlier, heat can be complex. You know, that temperature that you see on the thermometer is the temperature in the shade and it does not account for humidity. So um, this chart is a really handy thing that I found where, you know, on the left here, you can look at air temperature. So this is the temperature that you see. If they say it's 92 degrees outside, you know, this, that's what you're putting here. But then you also want to look for the relative humidity, um, which they'll usually show you. Like if you, you know, Google, you know, St. Louis weather, um, it'll tell you the temperature, like a big number that says temperature, and then a little tiny thing off to the side that says humidity, and then it'll say something percent. Um, and so that's what this number up here is, and you and you cross reference it. So say it's you know 90 degrees and it's you know 50 percent humidity, which is not unheard of here. Then it's saying that in here it's going to feel you know like 95 ish or 97 or so degrees, and it's in this range that is, that says hot. So that hot is this you know this kind of orange color. And here it'll tell you, you know, sunstroke, heat cramps, or heat exhaustion is possible with prolonged exposure and or physical activity. Um, when you get into like the very hot or the extremely hot, um, you get into things like for the extremely hot, you know, heat, sunstroke, highly likely with continued exposure. So not even with like, I'm doing lots of activity, but just like being out there. So, you know, you really want to kind of kind of look at these because you might think, oh, like 100 degrees, you know, is hot. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, like that's hot. That feels hot like maybe down here, but if the humidity is high enough, you know, if it's 60% 60, 60 humidity, which again is not unheard of here, um, that's in this extremely hot and you really don't want to be outside. So generally what I would tell people is you, you really just kind of don't want to work when the threshold gets into the very hot or the extremely hot. Um, and you want to be careful when you're in the hot, the hot range. Um, and this, you know, again, varies from person to person. Some people are going to be more easily able to take the very hot. Some people are like, I can't even handle if I'm in the hot range, you know, it, it, it depends. Um, but this is just a nice chart um, that I found and that, and that we um, try and use as well, like when we're deciding um, if we're gonna do things or not outside and kind of what we're doing outside. <clears throat> so then kind of like kind of your, your activity or what you're gonna do it is also should be influenced by how hot it is. So you should work during smart times. So work in the early morning and then again in the evening when the temperatures are cooler. And also even sometimes more importantly, when the sun is just less intense, uh, when the sun is more directly overhead, it's just, it's like literally it's more intense. The heat that is hitting you per square foot is greater than when it's, at a lower angle in, in the sky. And so working in those early morning, um, evening times is a better option if you're able to do it. This is also not the time, like these really hot periods are not the time to be doing strenuous activity. This is not the time to be shoveling or moving soil like this picture here on the right. That is a time for, as you can see in the picture, for early spring when there's no leaves on the tree and it's like kind of cold outside. Um, you should not be doing heavy, heavy work when it's real hot outside, it's, it's, I mean, if you can avoid it, it's not a good idea. Um, because the more physically demanding things you're doing, your body is also producing heat. So if it's really hot outside and then you're shoveling soil and moving stuff, your body is also producing heat and it's harder for it to, to lose that heat. And so you overheat more quickly. Um, it feels hotter. You can't handle the heat as well. And also work slower, be lazier in the garden. Um, because again, the more you work, you know, the faster you're moving, you know, the, the, you know, the faster you're pulling weeds and moving around and everything, you're producing more heat. Um, and it's going to be harder for you to, to stay cool in those situations and take breaks time out of the sun and, or in air conditioning, um, gives you time to cool off. It gives you time, your body time to, to let off that excess heat before you go back out and continue working. Uh, staying hydrated is really critical. Um, for you, just like it is for your plants, 
um, even more so in, in a lot of ways. Um, sweating is a major way that your body cools itself. If you're dehydrated, like significantly dehydrated, you're not going to be sweating as much. Um, but you can also lose a shocking amount of water to sweating. Like that you, you I mean, you might not really think about it, but you can you lose anywhere from four to 12 and a half cups of water every single hour from sweating, depending on the temperature, the humidity, and the amount of physical activity. And the higher the humidity, the more you sweat even though you, the sweat isn't as effective, your body like pumps out more sweat, the higher the, hum, the humidity. And so, you know, if you're in a situation where you're sweating 12 and a half cups of water every hour, and you're not drinking 12 and a half cups of water every hour, you are becoming dehydrated. And so you really need to be drinking water um, as you're outside doing things uh, because you need to replace that water or you are going to become dehydrated. You're going to start getting headaches. You're going to start being uncomfortable. You're going to, you know, it's not good. Um, so drink plenty of water, have water with you. Um, hydration packs are really nice, especially if you're not good about stopping and, and drinking water, having a hydration pack where it's like on your back with a water. And there's like just a straw right here where you can just stick in your mouth and like drink water, even like as you're continuing to work can help you make sure that you're actually getting enough water, especially if you are not one to stop regularly and drink water. So also, um, dressing smart. So clothes have an enormous impact on how much heat you retain. Um, it's kind of why we invented clothes in the first place, uh, is they, they keep us warm. Um, but in the summer, when you don't want to stay warm, you also need to be thinking about, you know, how much heat are these clothes retaining? Um, how much is the clothing I'm wearing impacting how hot I feel? Um, and, they, and so if you're wearing, you know, a sweatshirt, you're going to be a lot hotter because that's why sweatshirts exist, is to make you hotter. So you want clothes that aren't going to heat up themselves. Um, you want clothes that are going to allow airflow and also won't trap your sweat. Um, you want enough airflow that the sweat on you is going to evaporate through the clothes or be absorbed by the clothes and then evaporate off or something like that. So generally what this means is light, as in like, like lightweight, thin type materials, um, a loose weave so that there's more airflow and generally natural fiber clothing. Um, which I'll, which I'll talk about why I say that. So when the humidity is high, um, also in, in, in some instances, if you're in the shade, especially, um, when the humidity is high, having fewer clothes is usually helpful because it allows uh, more airflow over your skin, um, which helps the sweat evaporate more quickly. And what I mean by that is like wearing shorts is better than long pants, wearing short sleeves is better than long sleeves um, because you get, you get more skin that is getting more airflow, which helps the sweat to evaporate more quickly. In low humidity environments, um, you know, like if you go out west where the sun is more intense because you're at a higher elevation and there's like no moisture in the air, um, actually having long sleeves, long pants um, can be better because they block the heat of the sun, um, which is a, a larger factor in how hot you feel in those environments than humidity. Uh, in terms of what kind of textiles to pick, like what type of fabric and material to pick, um, like I said, thin clothes hold in less heat and also allow more airflow through them. And more airflow means sweat evaporates more quickly. Open weave allows better airflow, um, again, allowing um, more sweat to evaporate. Um, and this, this picture over here is, is kind of an example. So this is a linen material. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell how thin it is, but you can see, like you can see kind of the weave in it. Um, and so the, like, the, it's got like a, a loose, a more loose weave than like a real tight knit um, thing with like real fine fabrics, which is usually what you see more with synthetics, like this shirt that I'm wearing right here. There's, I can't see through it at all. It's like the, the weave is really tight. Um, so data on what fiber is best, like, you know, cotton versus polyester versus whatever is mixed. Um, different studies show different things. Um, however, every study that I looked at uh, linen and cotton were consistently kind of in the category of the best performing list um, when you were comparing like the same weave, the same weight of fabric, but with different fibers. Um, synthetics were not consistently on there, despite the fact that most clothing that they sell saying this will cool you down is synthetic. Um, it really seems to have more to do with how heavy weight the, the material is, how loose the weave is, um, things like that. Color um, is also highly debated. You know, a lot of people think like, oh, obviously you want to wear white clothes because you'll stay cooler. But there's actually some really crazy data that shows that maybe dark colored clothes. Um, so the color is debated. I usually like lighter color clothes, but, you know, do your own thing. 
Shoes are another thing that, that was really interesting. So your feet are incredibly sensitive to heat and you have a lot of blood running close to the skin. Um, to the point that there was actually, there was a study that was done where they were like, if we have an office and we just tell people to wear flip-flops so that they're like feet are exposed and then we blow the air conditioning on the floor instead of in the air, could we lower our air conditioning? And they were able to raise the temperature in the building by, I think it was five degrees by doing that. And everyone felt just as comfortable as when they were in the building with shoes on five degrees colder. Um, so having your feet exposed to the air um, can make you feel significantly cooler. Um, so wearing no shoes or open shoes like flip-flops or sandals, if it's safe to do so, um, can make you feel cooler. Again, especially if it's, if it's, if it's humid outside because you get more airflow, your sweat's gonna be evaporating. Um, there was even studies that showed that light colored shoes keep your feet cooler than dark colored shoes, like sometimes pretty significantly. But sorry, and I know I'm uh, getting close to time here. Um, but there's just a couple more, couple more things here. So blocking the sun can also be very helpful. So being in direct sun makes it feel 10 to 15 degrees hotter. And that's again, really significant. If you're talking about if it's 85 degrees outside and you're in direct sun, it could feel like a hundred degrees, which also means, you know, if it, you know, feels like a hundred degrees and then all of a sudden you go in the shade, it could feel like 85. And that's, I mean, that's a big difference. So if it, um, the, the problem with, with casting shade though, in our humid environment, is if the thing you're using to produce shade also blocks airflow, it might not make you feel any cooler. It might actually make you feel more hot because your sweat is not able to evaporate. You're just getting sweat, you feel gross, um, and you might not actually be feeling more cool. So things like wide brim hats are really popular. So this picture like over here, it casts shade. As you can see, you can't you know see the top of their face at all and their shoulders are, are shaded. So that can um, help. But again, if the hat doesn't provide good airflow and your head is like sweating like crazy, it might actually make you feel more hot than if you weren't wearing a hat at all. So ideally you want something that blocks the sun, but is not close to your body. And the answer to that is something that Americans don't like. And that answer is umbrellas or parasols. Um, you know, Americans are perfectly fine with using an umbrella to keep rain off of them. But for some reason, we think it's weird to use it to keep sun off of us. Um, but they work really well. Uh, and you can use just like a normal type umbrella that you carry around. Although in the garden, that doesn't really work very well because then you don't have two hands to be doing gardening. Um, but you can use that. Um, or you can use like a big beach type umbrella like this. And so, I mean, the, the way that I like to do that, I have a big one that's kind of beat up um, that wasn't being used for anything. And I kind of, I just kind of lay it on the ground like this, just next to me so that it's casting shade right wherever I'm sitting, planting, weeding, whatever I'm doing. Um, and it's great. Uh, there's, some, there's some interesting studies, again, to do with color. We you know a lot of people think like, oh, you want a white umbrella. Uh, but there, there are pretty conclusive studies on the color of umbrellas to cool you down. And the answer is black umbrellas cool you down more. Uh, and the reason for that is that black um, fabrics block light more completely. So a, a light colored fabric, like a light or white color umbrella is gonna let light through. And you can see that like if you take like, you know, a white umbrella and you like hold it up to the sun, you can see light coming through versus if you put it like a black one up to the sun, you're gonna see very little or at least significantly less light coming through. And so with that light, with less light coming through, you're also getting less infrared radiation, which is, which is what that feeling you get, like the heat of the sun is infrared radiation. So the umbrella itself heats up a lot more when it's black, but the umbrella's up here. Who cares if it's hotter? It's not, it's not touching you. It's not heating you up. It's just blocking a more, com it's more completely blocking the heat from the sun. So if you've got an old patio umbrella sitting around, crank it open, take it down with you to the garden, try it out. It's shockingly effective. Um, you can also use just a normal umbrella. I've also done that if I didn't want to lug the big thing around. If you get like a, a decent size normal umbrella and you just kind of stick it next to you like real close, you can kind of like sneak under there if you're weeding kind of hunched over and it can help a lot if the sun is really intense where you are. Another uh, thing that you can do that's like a more active, like that you're gonna be like using energy is to create airflow. So fans help cool you off, especially if humidity is high and they help cool you off by accelerating the rate at which sweat, sweat evaporates. 
um, and the faster sweat evaporates, the cooler you feel. So you can just use like a personal fan. There's all those like little personal fans you can like hold and blow on your face or whatever. Um, they also make things called neck fans that just ha like hang around your neck and blow on your face, um, which I don't particularly like. I find them a little uncomfortable. Um, but there's but there's some that are designed more where they like will blow up like the side of your face, so it's not like blowing into your eyes or anything. Um, that can help cool you down. Um, you can get them for really cheap online. Um, there's even this crazy thing I found, which is a way that, um, you know, if you want a wide brim hat to cast shade, but your, your head gets too sweaty and it's uncomfortable, they make a solar powered fan hat <laughs> that you put this on your head and it casts the shade. And then the solar panel powers this little fan that blows air over the top of your head to keep, to keep your head cool. Um, so there's, there's lots of kind of interesting things out there that you can find. And then there's active cooling. So there are some ways that you can actively cool yourself off. Ice packs are a big way um, to do this or probably like the, the, the easiest way that you might already have to do this. Um, there's, even, there's even like ice pack vests, like they're specially made like vests that you can buy. You stick the whole thing in the freezer and then you like put it on and it's like, you know, makes your whole like, you know, chest back, everything cool. Like if you're getting overly hot and you can put it on um, and they'll usually stay cold for like an hour or so and then you gotta throw it back in the freezer. You can also, I've done this before, if you have a hydration pack, you can freeze the water in the hydration pack. And then when you have it on your back, it kind of keeps your back a little colder. Uh, and then as it melts, you have really, really cold water to drink. Uh, you can also, if you have just like ice packs like this, you could freeze them, put them in a cooler and then bring the cooler out with you to the garden. And then whenever you're like taking your break, pull them out and kind of put them on, you know, your neck, your wrists, uh, backs of your knees, elbows, your feet. Um, those are all places that have lots of blood flow. And so putting them on those points can help cool you off um, pretty quickly. And then whenever you're done with your break, stick it back in the cooler and then your next break, you can come back and use it again. Uh, I always like to have a note on those like cooling towels that people sell. I know some people like swear by them, um, but the, the problem with them in our climate is that essentially what those cooling towels are is it's sweating. It's, you know, you have a wet material that you're putting on you and then as it evaporates, it cools you off. Well, the problem is if the humidity is so high that your sweat isn't evaporating, it's not going to be evaporating off the towel either. Um, and so, I mean, they, they evaporate a little bit better off the towel than off of you, but not that significantly. And so there's been quite a few studies that have found that if the humidity is over 50%, which is like almost all the time, right now it's surprisingly low because it hasn't rained in so long here, but usually in the summer when it's hot, it's also really humid here. And, and so they don't really work that well um, oftentimes. But in some instances they might work really well. Um, or if you're like wearing it while you're like riding your bike or something where you're getting a huge amount of airflow over it, they, they can help. But if you're just like sitting in your garden and it's really humid outside, they're not gonna do that much for you really. And then this is a new thing. This is my last slide here. Uh, this is a new thing uh, that's just come out in the last couple of years that are really cool. Um, I have one that I've been using the last uh, week or two that my wife bought for me. Uh, and they are peltier coolers. So um, they're often called personal air conditioners. They're not an air conditioner. Um, but what it is, is it's a it's a, it's a type of cooling that is often used in electronic devices where there's a metal panel and when an electrical current goes through this like special type of metal panel, it makes it so that one side of the panel becomes really hot and the other side becomes really cold. And so what this is, is this is a wearable item that you put and it like touches your skin somewhere uh, that then you turn it on and the part that's touching your skin gets really cold. And so it's kind of like an electronic ice pack. Um, and so it just runs and it's like, you can just have an ice pack on your neck, like all the time, except it doesn't like warm up over time. Like an ice pack does. It continues to stay cold until the battery runs out. Uh, they last anywhere from one to eight hours, depending on what model you're looking at and kind of what setting it's on. You know, if you have like the coldest setting, it's not going to last as long as, you know, the lower settings. Uh, Sony makes one called the Rion that is worn um, under your clothes. So that's the one that I have. Uh, you can't really see it other than like the thing that kind of hooks on your neck. You can kind of see it looks like a weird necklace kind of, um, but then it goes on the back of your neck and there's just like this cold plate that kind of you can like tuck in your shirt so you can't really see it that much. Um, and it just keeps you a, a little cooler uh, and you just plug it in. It's got like a rechargeable battery. 
<clears throat> most of them, however, are worn around the neck like a neck fan. So something like this. So this is one called the Coolify, um, which seems to be one of the, the better ones that, um, that you're like wearing around your neck like that, but it's pretty obvious. Like, you know, walking around out in public with that might look a little weird, which maybe you care about, maybe you don't. <clears throat> so this one, and most of the ones that, that um, can be worn on the neck uh, have both the peltier coolers, which is what this weird little graphic is showing. This does not look like this. It's just like a stainless steel plate is what it looks like. Um, but it's just trying to show that it's really ice cold. Um, and so it's like these cold plates that go on the side of your neck to help keep your neck cool. And then, you know, these weird little graphics are showing that there's fans that blow up kind of your neck. And then there's also actually fans that blow down kind of on your, on your back and your chest. Um, kind of all at the same time. So those are really cool. They're not cheap, um, but if you work outside a lot or heat really bothers you, it might, it might be worth it. Um, I have really enjoyed the one that I got as a present. Um, it's been really nice, even in like, you know, you get in your car and it's like unbelievably hot and you're like in like clothes that are not cool because you're like going to work or going to somewhere and then you get all sweaty and nasty. It's nice. Like I even like wear it in the car sometime that like helps helps keep me cool um, before the car cools down. So I'm not like real gross whenever I get to a meeting or something. Um, so, yeah, so that's um, so those are pretty much all my uh big suggestions for keeping the garden cool and then also keeping you cool. Uh, I hope that was helpful um, and that if you have any more questions, for sure, let me know.